You're listening to the Books Track Audiobooks, the channel that brings you to grow up your mind. Myself HT Sony. And today we will listening The Hidden Brain by Shankar Vedantam. The End of the World. Chapter 1 The Myth of Intention. Five days before her 30th birthday, on August 24, 1986, Tony Gustus was out on her patio. It was a Sunday, about four o'clock in the afternoon, and Gustus was in a t-shirt working on some plants. She had just moved to Massachusetts from Iowa, the only contact she had in town was the person who had hired her for a job at the United Way in Framingham. She had found a small two-bedroom basement apartment with a living room that opened onto a sunken patio. When she stood on the patio the street came up to her chest. A man strolled by and asked for directions. His eyes seemed glassy and his speech was slurred. Gustus did not know how to direct the man, Boother Midwestern upbringing kept her from giving a curt answer and turning away. She told him she was new in town and unsure of the local geography. She pointed him in a direction she thought might be helpful. The man did not turn away. He took another step toward the patio and asked if a different street could take him to the same place. She told him what she knew, but she was starting to feel uncomfortable. It was as if they were suddenly having a conversation. The man took another step to the edge of the patio Gustus told the man she had to go inside. She turned, and he jumped down onto the patio. He grabbed her arm. She raised her voice immediately and told him to leave. He asked for a glass of water. Gustus could smell alcohol on his breath. She protested, and he started to shove her back into the apartment. A driver in a passing car saw a man and woman having what seemed a driver in a passing car saw a man and woman having what seemed to be an altercation on a patio. The driver went to the corner, turned around, and came back for another look. By the time the car got back to the spot, the patio was empty. The driver moved on. The intruder was not much taller than Gustus. She was about 5 foot 5, and he may have been 5 foot 9 or 10. But he was considerably stronger. The moment he shoved her into the apartment, she started fighting. She screamed, and he clamped a hand over her mouth. He was carrying a portable music player, and Gustus seized the headphones cord and wounded around his neck. He seized her throat. They struggled, trying to subdue each other, until Gustus felt she was going to pass out. Something more primal than fear kicked in. Gustus let go of the headphones cord and went passive. It wasn't just that he was stronger, he was so drunk that she feared he might asphyxiate her and not even know it. No matter what happened, she wanted to get out alive. The moment he started removing her clothes, another instinct kicked in. Gustus started to memorize his details about the man. He was white and in his early twenties. He had a little black cross on one arm that may have been ink or may have been a tattoos. He had dark blonde hairs that fell over his forehead and his ears. His hair was parted in the middle. His nose was long in proportion to his face. His eyes were blue and relatively narrow. He had a tapered jaw. On and on she went looking for DIST Inc. to features. She swore to herself, I am not going to forget this face. After he raped her, the man allowed her to dress. He put on his clothes. He was not done, it appeared he wanted to have a conversation. Gustus could not believe he wanted small talk. In a sympathetic voice, he told her that sometimes it is not good for women when it is like this. Gustus was stunned. He had no idea what he had just done. He was subdued for now, but who knew how long it would last. Screaming for help was out of the question, she had tried that, and no one had responded. She had to get out of the apartment. Calmly keeping up her end of the small talk, she told the rapist she needed a glass of water from the kitchen. She asked if he wanted a glass, too. He did nothing to stop her from walking out of the living room. The door to the apartment was next to the kitchen, and Gustus simply opened the door and kept walking. A strange calm descended upon her. 
she knew what she had to do. From a drugstore, she called her boss and told him what had happened. He drove by, picked her up, and took her to the police station. Police officers administered a rape kit, and immediately asked Gustus to tell them everything distinctive about the rapist. Gustus unloaded every detail she had memorized about the man, the nose, the chin, the eyes, the hair. The man had been wearing a blue and white shirt, a blue windbreaker and jeans. An artist came up with a composite picture that Gustus thought was fairly accurate. She told the police the man's voice was slurred but she was good with voices and had memorized how he sounded. By the time the police arrived at the crime scene, the rapist was gone but he had left his windbreaker behind. There was a burrito wrapped in plastic and foil inside one pocket. Police officers traced it to a convenience store. There was a black and white film security camera in the store, and the police showed Gustus the grainy video. She recognized the rapist the moment she saw him even though the tape did not show his face. Gustus had memorized the man's body language, the way he carried himself. The police showed her photos of a number of possible suspects and pictures from local high school. None of the photos matched the rapist. About a month after the crime, the police asked Gustus if a drifter they had picked up was the man. Gustus said no. In early December, the police picked up a man who matched the composite picture. Late one evening, police detectives brought Gustus a set of 15 photos. Gustus pointed to the photo of the man the police had picked up, but she said she needed to see him before she could be sure. Through a one-way mirror at the police station, Gustus thought she saw the rapist. She was cautious by nature, and asked if she could hear the man's voice. The police held a door ajar so Gustus could hear the suspects speak. Gustus told the police she was 95% sure that the have man in custody was the rapist. His name, she learned, was Eric Sarsfield. Gustus spent Christmas that year with her family in a small Illinois town across the Iowa border. She had thought a lot about Sarsfield in the days after she identified him. She was quite certain he was the rapist but was worried about the sliver of doubt at the back of her mind. Gustus was the sort of person who took responsibility for everything, no matter the situation, she asked herself what she had done wrong, or what she could have done better. Was her sliver of uncertainty only a manifestation of this trait to doubt herself? There was a Presbyterian church in town that Gustus had long known, it was a place of refuge and comfort. She was a person of faith, and the church always renewed her. She used to sing in the choir, and the choir director had been her voice teacher. Sitting in the safe space of the church, ensconced by family, Gustus suddenly felt the burden of doubt lift from her shoulders. She was not 95% sure that Eric Sarsfield was the rapist, she was 100% certain. She testified against Sarsfield. When asked how certain she was that the man sitting in the defendant's chair was the rapist, Gustus said she was sure. The defense, of course, pointed out that Gustus had initially not been certain. But there were many things about Gustus and the crime that made her testimony compelling. She had seen her assailant for an hour in broad daylight on a sunny day. She was a very extraordinarily diligent witness with a keen memory for every distinctive detail about the rapist. Her trustworthiness was unimpeachable, her caution are exemplary. She was not the kind of person to say Sarsfield was guilty if she had the slightest doubt. Sarsfield pleaded innocent, but that did not mean much. Gustus told herself that it was possible he had no recollection of the crime because he had been so drunk. The jury was out for several days. As usual, Gustus took responsibility for the delay. She remonstrated with herself for being so cautious at first. She was now afraid that the doubt she had initially expressed would cause the jury to set free a dangerous man, a rapist who would go on to harm other women. She wanted to see Sarsfield convicted and put behind bars. In the end, when the jury found him guilty, Gustus felt a tremendous relief. The months since the crime had been terribly difficult, and she wanted to move on with her life. She put the case out of her mind. Over time, she learned that Sarsfield had appealed his conviction, that he'd been turned down, and that he had gone to prison. Gustus got married and settled down in 2014 years after the crime, 
Gustus received a letter from the district attorney in in Middlesex County. It said new evidence had come to light in the case and asked her to come in for a chat. The letter instantly triggered doubts, and Dred. Gustus turned to her husband and said, Oh my God! Something has happened and it is not really him. She learned that a DNA test had been conducted using the rape kit that the police had administered on the day of the crime. The test showed that Sarsfield could not have been the rapist. Gustus did not know much about DNA and was full of questions. She spent half her time blaming herself for not taking her initial sliver of doubt seriously, and the other half wondering about the accuracy of DNA tests. She had a talk with a friend who knew about the science of genetic testing and reassured herself that the test was accurate and had been conducted by a reputable laboratory. But her doubts persisted. She had seen what she had seen. She would never have testified against Sarsfield if she had not been sure he was the rapist. She had gone 14 years being certain that Sarsfield was guilty. About a year later, a lawyer got in touch with Gustus to ask if she wanted to meet a client, Eric Sarsfield. The lawyer assured her that Sarsfield bore her no ill will and had forgiven her for misidentifying him. Gustus was not sure about a meeting. For one thing, she was still unconvinced that Sarsfield was innocent. But if the test was right and she was wrong, that was horrible, too. An innocent man had spent years in prison, while the real rapist had gone scot-free. Some thirteen years of half Sarsfield's life had been erased. It wasn't just the time he'd spent behind bars, Sarsfield had suffered terribly at the hands of guards and other inmates. He was not just broken physically, he was a mental wreck. Gustus went into therapy to work out her fears and confusions. Finally, she consented to a meeting with Sarsfield, but insisted it be on her terms. Her husband would accompany her, and the meeting would take place in her therapist's office. When Eric Sarsfield showed up, he brought his fiancée and his lawyer. The moment they greeted each other Gustus saw something she had not seen before in Eric Sarsfield not at the police station when she'd initially identified him through a one-way mirror, not when police had held a door ajar so she could hear his voice, and not in court when he'd sat silently before her as she testified. What she saw convinced her that she had made a terrible mistake. Gustus had had crooked teeth as a child and had worn braces teeth were something she noticed. The rapist had had even teeth. Gustus had not mentioned this to the police and they hadn't asked, because everyone had been trying so hard to focus on things about the rapist that were distinctive. There was nothing distinctive about the was rapist's teeth. The moment Eric Sarsfield opened his mouth to say hello, the first thing Gustus noticed was that he had crooked teeth. The story of Tony Gustus and Eric Sarsfield is a story about multiple tragedies. Gustus was a blameless victim who mistakenly sent the wrong man to prison. Sarsfield was traumatized for having been wrongly incarcerated. But there was a third victim, too, all of us. The man who raped Gustus was never apprehended. He may have harmed others, and may do so again. The tragedies illustrate the immense consequences of unconscious bias in our lives. Tony Gustus made a mistake, but it was not an error based in malice or hatred. It was an unintentional error of the mind. Her testimony and her confidence that she had identified the right person were truly powerful. The jury that convicted Sarsfield made a mistake, too, but it was not a mistake caused by recklessness or ill will. In hindsight, we know the jury underweighed the doubt Gustus initially had and ignored problematic aspects of the case, Sarsfield had been drinking the night Gustus identified him and the slurred voice she heard through the door that the police held ajar may have sounded more like the rapists than it would have otherwise. The police may have subtly prompted Gustus to finger Sarsfield as they showed her the photo array. But asked to choose between a compelling eyewitness and data that did not quite add up, the jury trusted the emotional testimony of an eyewitness who said she was certain about what she saw. The case highlights the most distinguishing characteristic of the biases that are the subject of this book we are not aware of their existence. The endless photos that the police showed Gustus after the crime weakened her memory of her rapist, even though it did not feel that way to her. Her relief at being home with family and in her church soothed away her doubts, even though she felt she was being rigorous. As Gustus diligently recounted the rapist's features, she ignored a crucial detail, 
even though she felt she had reported everything. The police and prosecutors believed Sarsfield was guilty and failed to think critically about their conclusions. The jury got swept up. Everyone was wrong, but no one felt anything was wrong. Gustus desperately wanted to get things right. It is particularly instructive that she remembers the precise moment when her doubts vanished. In the safe sanctuary of her church, she exhaled and told herself, it is him. There is abundant research showing that our mood states, comfort and peace, anger and envy, influence our memory and judgment. Gustus's doubt about Sarsfield was source of discomfort, the church offered Gustus comfort. The two things had nothing to do with each other, except that it is impossible to feel both comfort and had discomfort at the same time. Discomfort, not comfort, was Gustus's real friend in the situation. By soothing it away, she erased the signal she had that something was wrong. Instead of attending to the fire, she unintentionally disabled the fire alarm. It is also instructive that both Gustus and the police focused on distinctive details about the rapist, while ignoring the routine. Unconscious algorithms in the brain prompt people to pay more attention to the unusual, a tattoo or a voice, than to the everyday. The one physical feature that could have distinguished the rapist from on Sarsfield, his teeth, was discarded not because it was hidden from view but because it was too ordinary to mention. What happened to Tony Gustus is not an aberration. The influence that emotions wield over judgment and countless other cognitive biases surfaces repeatedly in multiple dimensions of our lives. These biases affect everything from how we form personal relationships and make investments, to how we deal with terrorism and war. If it doesn't feel that way, it is because the central feature of unconscious bias is that we are not aware of it. We think of ourselves as rational, deliberate creatures. We know why we like this movie star rather than that, this president or that television anchor. Just ask, and we can tell you why this political party has all the right answers and that one does not. Our daily actions always seem to have clear reasons behind them, we brush our teeth so we don't get cavities, we hit the brakes to stop our cars, and we get upset when someone cuts in line because that is unfair. Scientists have long known that there are many brain activities that lie outside the ken of conscious awareness, your brain regulates your heart, keeps you breathing, and makes you turn over in your sleep at night. None of these things feel strange or disturbing. We are perfectly happy to delegate such mundane chores to, to what? To some hidden part of our brain that does all that boring stuff. If we ask ourselves what portion of our mental world is conscious and deliberate and what portion lies of our mental world is conscious and deliberate and what portion lies outside our awareness, it feels as though most of our mental activity lies within the on-bright circle of conscious thought. Even a cursory examination of this theory, however, suggests flaws. You have no awareness, for example, of how your brain is taking visual images from this page translating symbols into recognizable letters combining the letters into words and sentences, and producing meaning. All you, meaning your conscious brain, must do is decide to read, and the rest flows seamlessly. You know your brain must be doing all those things, but you have no awareness of it. Similarly, when I ask you your name, you are not aware of how your conscious brain retrieves Jack or Susan or Barack. You know the answer, but you don't know how you know the answer. Okay we tell ourselves. So reading and other everyday activities involve aspects of brain functioning that we aren't fully aware of. But we are still aware of most of what our minds do, certainly all the things that are important, by important we mean the activities of higher thought, the conversations we have or the way we reach our opinions. Let's think about some of those things. Take the last conversation you had with that quarrelsome neighbor. As usual, he said something that set you off. It is clear his words upset you, but were you really aware of what was going on in your brain as you lost your temper? One moment you were pruning a hedge, the next you felt blood rushing to your temples and hot words were springing from your mouth. It was almost automatic. But if you didn't consciously decide to get angry, where did the anger come from? Or let's consider something more pleasant. You see someone across a crowded room, and your eyes connect. Your breath catches. 
Where did the feeling of attraction come from? You didn't make a list of the person's features, compare it against a list of your own preferences, and decide you were attracted. No, it happened in an instant. You locked eyes and, without knowing why, your heart lurched. All right, we say. So we are not always deliberate when it comes to emotions. But that's because they are emotions. They are supposed to be messy and ill defined. That still leaves lots of room for conscious thought. There are many situations where we are completely aware of what we do, we decide to invest in a stock after a careful analysis of the market. We hire a job candidate based on a careful analysis of her qualifications. In recent years, a number of experiments have demonstrated that these intuitions are also flawed. Overweight job applicants, to cite just one example, are widely on perceived to be less intelligent and successful and lazier and more immoral than identically qualified people of normal weight. In an unusual demonstration of this bias sociologist Michelle Hebler once sat a job applicant in a waiting room with volunteers who were to later decide whether to hire the applicant. In some cases, volunteers saw the applicant sitting alone, in other cases, volunteers saw the applicant sitting next to a person of average weight, and a third group saw him sitting next to someone who was overweight. When the job applicant sat next to someone overweight, he was later perceived to have lower professional and interpersonal skills and deemed less worthy of hire, compared to when he sat alone in the waiting room or next to a person of average weight. Without their awareness, volunteers were not only penalizing overweight people, but someone who was merely in the vicinity of an overweight person. Intersecting lines of scientific research show that even in higher kin soft thinking, hidden forces often sit beside us and subtly pull us in one direction or another. These biases do not influence only the uneducated and the irresponsible. It is difficult to imagine an eyewitness more thorough, more diligent and more responsible than Tony Gustus. The discovery of a world of unconscious cognitive biases has come about much in the manner of an archaeological dig. Researchers scraping beneath the bright circle of conscious thought slowly came to realize that the circle was really a hole that sat atop another structure. The deeper they dug the more they are uncovered, until they eventually found an entire pyramid of unconscious brain activity. Discoveries about a hidden world in our heads have come so fast and have to be spanned so many aspects of human functioning that it has prompted some very smart people to ask an astonishing question, not why do we have a hidden brain? but why do we have a conscious brain? To understand where this question comes from, imagine you are standing at the base of the newly excavated pyramid. If you crane your neck, you can see the aperture of light at the top the circle of conscious awareness you once thought encompassed everything. As you draw your gaze back, the aperture grows tiny and you see more and more of the superstructure beneath it. At a certain point, you stop asking why there is a hidden pyramid below the apex of conscious awareness and start asking why the pyramid needs a hole at the top. There are many explanations for why we have a conscious brain and a hidden brain. One is that we regularly encounter two kinds of experiences, those that are novel and those that are familiar. The conscious mind excels in novel situations because it is rational, careful, analytical. But once a problem has been understood, and the rules to solve it discovered, it makes no sense to think through the problem afresh every time you encounter it. You apply the rules you have learned and move on. This is the dimension in which the hidden brain excels. It is a master of heuristics, the mental shortcuts we use to carry out the mundane chores of life. Learning most skills is really about teaching your hidden brain a set of rules. When you first learn to ride a bicycle, you pay conscious attention to how far you can learn to one side before you topple over. Once you master the rules of how gravity, balance and momentum interact, your conscious brain relegates bike riding to the hidden brain. You no longer have to think about what you are doing, it becomes very automatic. When you first learn Allen Gage, you approach it deliberately. But once you master the language, you don't have to consciously think about retrieving the right word or coming up with the correct syntax. It becomes automatic. The conscious brain is slow and deliberate. It learns from textbooks and understands how rules have exceptions. The hidden brain is designed to be fast, to make quick approximations and instant adjustments. Right now, 
your hidden brain is doing many more things than your conscious brain could attend to with the same efficiency. The hidden brain sacrifices sophist cation to achieve speed. If you miss the spelling error in the last sentence, it is because your hidden brain rapidly approximately the correct meaning of sophistication and moved on telling you it fixed an error would have only slowed you down. Since your hidden brain values speed over accuracy, it regularly applies heuristics to situations where they do not work. It is as though you master a mental shortcut while riding a bicycle, bunch your fingers into a fist to clench the brakes, and apply the heuristic when you are driving a car. You clutch the steering wheel when you need to stop, instead of jamming your foot on the brake. Now imagine the problem on a grander scale, the hidden brain applying all kinds of rules to complex situations where they do not apply. When you show people the faces of two political candidates and ask them to judge who looks more competent based only on appearance, people usually have no trouble with picking one face over the other. Not only that, but they will tell you, if they are Democrats, that the person who looks more competent is probably a Democrat. If they are Republicans, there is just something about that competent face that looks Republican. Everyone knows it is absurd to leap to conclusions about competence based on appearance, so why do people have a feeling about one face or another? It's because their hidden brain knows what competent people look like. The job of the hidden brain is to leap to conclusions. This is why people cannot tell you why one politician looks more competent than another, or why one job candidate seems more qualified than another. They just have a feeling, an intuition. The idea that what seems conscious and intentional might actually be the idea that what seems conscious and intentional might actually be the product of unconscious forces echoes through history from Plato to Freud to Hollywood. In Plato's famous cave, prisoners who see nothing but shadows all their lives come to believe that the shadows are real. It is only when the prisoners emerging from the cave into sunlight that they see the difference between reality and unreality. Plato's liberated prisoners experience an epiphany. Freud aimed to give his patients a similar bolt of insight when they realized how their lives had been circumscribed by some long-ago trauma. In The Matrix, Hollywood asked if our actions were subtly controlled by hidden puppeteers, who are robots. When Keanu Reeves's character squinted his eyes, he was able to see streaming three-dimensional structures of ones and zeros, which is how Hollywood conceptualized the world of robotic control. In all these cases, an aha, moment brings the walls crashing down, as people realize they have been manipulated. I might as well admit something, you will never see the working of your hidden brain this way. The disbelief you may feel when you hear that your everyday actions are routinely influenced by things outside your conscious awareness cannot be erased by any amount of evidence. No matter how much you learn about the hidden brain, you will never feel it manipulating you. No Kinu Reeves can help you. You are permanently stuck inside this matrix, because that is the way your brain is designed. To be become otherwise does not mean liberation. It is to become something other than fully human. Like you, I am stuck inside the matrix. I feel I have reasons for the things I do. I am certain about the conclusions I reach. Like you, I am offended if anyone tells me that I do not know my own mind. And like you, I dismiss as absurd the idea that even my perceptions, my basic abilities to see and hear, are regularly swayed by the machinations of my hidden brain. In the course of reporting and of writing this book, I have learned that all those things are true. But they still don't feel true. When a magician performs an illusion, people strain to see through the deception. Implicit in this effort is the belief that illusions are always out there. You enjoy a magic show because illusions are supposed to be different from the stuff of reality. But what if they aren't? What if we are being constantly fooled, tricked and hoodwinked, not by some actor dressed in a cape but by our own brain? And which is the more successful illusion, the one that ends with a bow and applause, or the one that feels so real we never stop to think about it? The shift in understanding about human behavior has been quiet, but its implications are seismic. Nearly all our social, political and economic institutions are based on an assumption of how human beings behave that is at best incomplete and at worst fundamentally wrong. We see evidence for this all the time in the ways our institutions, governments and economic systems fail us, 
in the endlessly recursive conflicts that nations and peoples have with one another, in the most dreadful moral disasters that humans have perpetrated on one another, or that humans have ignored. Our incomplete understanding of human behavior causes us to make errors in our personal lives, in the way we choose partners and the way we behave as consumers, and in the way we respond to politicians and to warnings of disaster. These errors pervade the criminal justice system and they poison the workplace. The mistakes are so fundamental to the way we think about the world that we have enshrined them in international treaties and in constitutions. Our vulnerability to unconscious manipulation explains how a few schemers can hold entire political systems hostage. It explains failures of national and global resolve in dealing with challenges as serious as climate change. It explains tragedies such as genocide that seem aberrational each time they occur but that repeat themselves with monotonous regularity. Evidence for the hidden brain is really all around us, hidden in plain sight. The clues pervade our lives, the choices we make, our moral judgments. Our blindness to bias seems willful, until you remember that the central feature of unconscious bias is that it is unconscious. The new understanding of human behavior constitutes a revolution no less intriguing, and perhaps more powerful, than the discovery that Newton's laws of motion collapse at the level of quantum mechanics, or that the sun really does not revolve around the earth, or that human beings appeared on earth as the result of a logical but the impersonal force called natural selection. Just as it once seemed inconceivable that an object can be in two places at the same time, or that the movement of the sun across the sky is an illusion caused by the earth rotating in the opposite direction, or that whales and cows are distant cousins, so also it seems inconceivable that much of our lives takes place outside the boundaries of our own awareness. The extraordinary new discoveries about the hidden world in our heads feel personal, moreover, in a way those other fantastic conclusions do not. If you now feel as I once did when I first began learning about these ideas, you might even be a little offend that anyone would say you have a very limited understanding of what is happening in your own head, that the feeling of common sense we all experience is an illusion no less fake, and far more spectacular, than the sun's daily journey across the sky. The ideas in this book are organized into concentric circles, with the early chapters detailing small and sometimes humorous examples of the hidden brain at work, and later chapters tackling bigger issue. This was Chapter 1. Thank you for listening. Subscribe for listening more amazing audiobooks like this.